Let's call on stage all our uh, beautiful speakers here. We have uh, Or uh, Mary uh, from Procter & Gamble, Ayasu Mac from Boeing, Annie Degani from Mastercard and Nano, Dikla Wagner from uh, New York Creek. Thanks for coming and spending your Wednesday evening. I was trying to think of the Asia today because uh, still very jet lag. But, uh, all right, so a rule of the games here is that uh, um, regardless of the setup, uh, this is a conversation with the audience. So a good number of the people sitting here are here to learn from you guys. Um, Alberto shared a few topics uh, and uh, you know way that we call different implementation areas of open innovation, specifically when it comes to uh, corporates uh, abroad and having innovation antennas. But really, the idea is that to uh, take some time also to get from the audience any specific, you know, uh, information they might need. Uh, probably half of them would be are in a situation where they're considering maybe to open an antenna specifically in Israel. So, so first things first. I think you have a, a, a mic to share. Let's start about the basic. Let's talk about uh, how you uh, your company makes money. Right, so some of you easier to some extent, at least we level the playing field. So why don't we go through uh, the list and we start from uh, PNG. Sure. Okay. Um, so yeah, PNG is uh, one of the largest uh, fast-moving consumer goods companies um, with iconic brands like Gillette, Oral-B, Ariel, Tide, etc. I can go on uh, for hours probably. Um, we serve 5 billion consumers all over the world. Um, and uh, yeah. let me just add, considering we're doing a quick introduction, uh, just a few words about the structure we represent and would you, do you report to within the organizations of uh, the right. large organization? Yeah, perfect. Um, so I'm part of the Global Tech Innovation Team. I report to the Global CIO. Um, I as uh, Innovation? Or no, information, information, Chief Information Officer. And the justice is just to compete in the how many people you have uh, in Israel. So in Israel, we have a total of 40 employees, but that's the total of PNG. Our group, we are four people. Four people. And then you have other innovation antennas, outposts in other ecosystems? Yes. So Israel was actually the second innovation outpost of PNG worldwide. You started here? And... We started here about six years ago. Okay. Um, the first was in Silicon Valley, obviously, and right now we have 18 innovation outposts worldwide. Oh yeah, Boeing, what, what is that company? Well, first of all, thank you all for staying awake uh, and being here all day in the conference room. So uh, really grateful, and it sounds like you guys have had a very busy day. So thank you for, we'll try to keep you awake. Uh, I work for the Boeing company. I've been with Boeing for 12 years now. Boeing has been around for 107 years. Uh, hopefully you guys came to Israel on a Boeing and not on an Airbus, right, yeah. everyone? Good. Uh, our presence in Israel is relatively small. Uh, Boeing has roughly 25 employees in country, but then we have a lot of partners in the country that are manufacturing, suppliers, and of course our, our customers. Um, the innovation team that I, I, I lead is um, an army of one, uh, one but mighty one, here in the, in the country. Uh, Better solo to... than in bad company, right? Excuse me? Better to be solo than in bad company. Right? Oh yeah, <laughs> I guess that's when we're looking at it. Um, and uh, reporting up to the CTO, uh, I'll share throughout the storytelling here in a few minutes, but we had a corporate event, a CBC, CBC within Boeing. We spun out the uh, uh, investment unit, left inside the innovation and technology implementation unit. That's what I lead today, uh, working very closely hand-in-hand -hand with our Ventures team. Um, and as I mentioned, reporting to CTO. Um, and you have the most difficult situation here, because you are <laughs> joint venture, a, you represent two brands in one, and so that's why we invited you to do The real reason is to ask Ilan to have five companies, but he <laughs> just was able to have four stools, and they say, okay. Two for the price of one. Yeah, got two for the price of one. So, yeah. I'll try to make it uh, less complicated. Uh, first, uh, hello everybody, happy to be here. So uh, I represent FinSec Innovation Lab, uh, FinSec for uh, uh, FinTech and probably uh, cybersecurity. 
um, which is a joint venture by Mastercard and Enel. So uh, you probably know both uh, Mastercard, a technology company in the Philippine payment, and Enel, uh, the Italian utility company, uh, which uh, joined forces uh, to bid for a tender to operate an innovation lab in Israel. Um, sponsored by uh, the Israel Innovation Authority, uh, the Ministry of Finance, and the Israel National Cyber Directorate. Um, so uh, Mastercard actually has uh, used to have only business activity in Israel. So when the lab was formed, I think there was there were like five people here, more or less. Um, and after acquiring a dynamic yield last year, now we have more than 300, something like that. Um, and the lab, in the lab we're a team of five. Uh, NL has only innovation and scouting activity in Israel. Uh, the, uh, we don't have really an open market uh, in energy in Israel. Um, what else? Um, what do you report to in this complicated structure? Who, um, so uh, under maybe so under MasterCard, we're actually part of the Cyber Intelligence Solutions, and under NL, we're part of NLX, which is the growth vector or everything which is not energy uh, in NL. Um, so, complex, but uh, yeah. a, a lot of follow-up questions there that will come in a second. Dikla. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Great to have you all here. Uh, my name is Dikla, Dikla Wagner. I'm head of tech scouting for Munich Re here in Israel. Munich Re, as you probably know, is one of the largest reinsurance companies in the world, uh, $300 billion under management. Uh, I'm the only person here in Israel representing them, so it's a one-woman show. Uh, they're doing a noise for at least 20 people, but I'm joking. Uh, my role here is really to bring opportunities for Munich Re. Uh, we started with investments, we're supporting investments as well, uh, partnership, uh, new product development. Uh, I'm working with all the technology that's connected to Israel, and now we're expanding also to Europe. Uh, we're working, of course, with Munichry as a core, but also with uh, the primary insurance that are owned by Munichry, Ergo in Germany, and AGSB in the state. And we're, of course, working with our clients as well, when they're looking to develop new products, to invest in technology, and so on. So I'm reporting, I was very fortunate and, and, and really lucky, I'm reporting to the Chief Innovation Officer of the, of the group, which is under the board. Um, and I think that Israel received a lot of support, and it's really thanks to the management level. The chief innovation sits in the uh, headquarters. In, in the uh, headquarters, and uh, is uh, responsible for the entire group. So, so also the Lloyds Market and also uh, the subsidiaries and so on. And you had one person in San Francisco who is no longer there, and exactly. now is in New York, right? Exactly. So we have another scouting office that used to be in the state, uh, in the Silicon Valley, and now we have, it's, it's been closed and we're opening a new one. Uh, in New York. In addition to that, we also have a lot of hubs around the world, um, also by Ergo, but some by us. And the big innovation group sits in the headquarter. There's around 20, 30 people. And what they're doing is to build ventures. So exactly to the model that you mentioned. Uh, now there's a little bit of shift. Uh, we're going back to more of a near core, but we have two scopes. So we're looking for near core, what we can develop right here, right now, but we're also looking at the horizon. How the industry, the insurance industry, we look like in five years from now, can we dream today to build something that will be the right fit for the industry in five years? Good. I think that was a good uh, a good introduction. So you get a sense of uh, at least what you guys are selling. No, uh, keep keep the mic because the first question I had is for you. I tried to follow uh, what Alberto presented before of the different implementations. Some of you are actually doing more than one thing, so we can cover why and how. But I would move from uh, R and D all the way to investments and anything in between. So talking to R and D. Uh, Annie, I will start with you because I think it, this, to some extent uh, what you're creating is kind of unique also compared to different models that we've seen around. So maybe you can give us a little more of a background of the genesis of the creation and what was the role in this case of the Innovation Authority? How did that help uh, two separate companies that are doing something totally different you know, to, to live under the same roof? Okay, so first of all, NL is actually a, is a MasterCard's client or customer. Um, and um, so there were a few questions here, so I try to follow, uh, follow them all. Um, 
Well, for MasterCard, MasterCard puts a lot of value and really appreciate connection with the government and being chosen by the Israeli government, uh, and especially Israel, and to operate an innovation lab in fintech and cybersecurity means a lot to them and also strengthen the brand. When you say being chosen, meaning that there was an open RFP yeah. and other company and it was already about fintech and other corporates applied, right? Yes, yeah, so um, the government actually had more innovation labs in other uh, areas, but in fintech and cybersecurity, we're the only one. And there was a specific uh, tender for our tender procedure for this uh, innovation lab in fintech and cybersecurity. Um, what, what were the terms? What was the govern, government offering as a, as a hook? I remember it really short. No, no, I, I, um, it's okay. Um, uh, so we work with uh, usually early stage startups and around six month program. Uh, conducting a technological POC and providing a lot of business assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, we have infrastructure, technological <coughs> infrastructure in the lab. We have a CTO working with the startups and we also choose them very carefully, like uh, we don't have batches or cohorts. We work with each company individually and build a, a specific program uh, after uh, performing a um, gap analysis and really tailor made uh, the PUC and also the business uh, advice. The question was more: What is the government giving to the to the ah, corporates? Okay, in order sorry. To, to attract no, but, them. Or... But it's important. Okay, it's important because the government provides startups a, a grant um, around five hundred thousand shekels. Uh, to perform the POC and also assist the, uh, the lab itself with some OPEX and CAPEX, but um, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, both companies probably uh, invested like 10 times more and in the government. Uh, so I, I think it wasn't really the money. Many, the money for the startup was important, but having um, like putting an innovation army in Israel needed some stars to be aligned and uh, being chosen by the Israeli government, uh, providing uh, a grant to the startups um, was uh, a, definitely a, an engine for all of this to happen because they realized even in the beginning that uh, uh, the operation will, will cost much more than the government will, uh, will provide. And NL at that time already had an, a similar innovation lab within construction tech together with a Shikun Ubino, an Israeli company, an Israel construction company. So um, um, I think uh, it made sense at the time. <laughs> to make it practical, again, for the corporates in the room, uh, if they wanted to consider something similar in their, in their industry, where should they go to look at uh, potential options or similar options? Or is that, that program still available? Yeah, in Israel, I think, um, no, actually they, they, uh, they publish like specific tenders. So I'm, I'm not sure if there's any tender open now, but uh, the, you need to approach the Israel Innovation Authority for that. And I, I think it's, it's a unique program. Uh, the Israel Innovation Authority in general is a very unique uh, yeah, authority. That, that, that's what uh, we got also today this morning, but uh, a deeper uh, presentation about that. And it's clearly for us that are you know present in different ecosystems is one of the unique uh, selling points that Israel has. Very strong. One thing that I, I want to add is that there are benefits in having a joint venture. You can uh, diversify uh, the interest, you share the risk, um, you have a, sometimes a, you bring different insights to uh, the screening process and also to the, um, um, even the focus areas or the things that you, you bring in. So, so a part, part of the um, request from the RFP was also to have a joint venture or that was your decision as, a, as two entity? It, it wasn't a request, but it was highly recommended. So, yes. <laughs> Called more restoration, yes. Yeah. It worked. Before we move on from the R and D, any other experiences here that are worth uh, sharing about you know some activities that are related to R and D? I guess they are your back into that side of the business. So we 
And the antennas, you got us right. We are on that uh, left column, but we have plans and aspirations to go to the right column. And <clears throat> something I'll say about the uh, Innovation Authority is that they are very uh, flexible and uh, willing to shape opportunities. So we, we have two uh, new ideas in the making, one of them around cyber, but cyber for aviation, which is really a closed garden community. And what we get there from uh, the government is not just the um, monetary support, but also some uh, due diligence on the players and actors. So when we invite people into this uh, cyber innovation hub, we also know that they are vetted, trustworthy, have credentials that you know the government of Israel trusts these people, uh, military background, of course, and then that offers us a lot of comfort that we're not letting into our systems people that we don't know who they come from, what their backgrounds are. So that's that's, that's both at a startup level and at a corporate level. Yeah. Um, so that's one other uh, pile on here. Another one um, is uh, offsets. I don't know how many of you in the uh, crowd here have sales into Israel, uh, and if there is any. Um, offset obligation that you may have that Boeing has major sales to the Israeli Air Force. I, mean, you, I, I joked on your our way in here with uh, the 737, 787, family, uh, but we also sell F-15s. People don't always remember or know that. Uh, we have missiles. We have a lot of uh, pointy, dangerous uh, arsenals in our uh, defense platforms. Um, so with, there is a, a bit of, a, of an offset obligation to, to Israel that comes with that. Um, and there as well, there is encouragement from the Innovation Authority not to go to your uh, tier one usual suspects, the Israel IAI, Elbit, all the players that you know are typically the ones that the government uh, and, and the external foreign entities are comfortable working with, but challenging us to go and work with the startup, enable the startup ecosystem, and as a result, warrant the higher offset credit. Um, so that's another point for anyone who's looking to uh, have significant sales, hopefully, for all of you in this country, and then the government requirement that uh, may come with that. I'll hand over. Something. You ask about um, the program that the government is releasing, and a lot of time the program, the, the government is doing, their, the authorities are doing their own research, and when they're selecting a topic, then you can find around it a few projects. So, for example, uh, at the time that uh, Israel wanted to to, um, to position Israel as a leading in cyber, we had a lot of national support and a lot of program around cyber. Now we see it more in AI, we see it more in climate, and I think that also during the time that the tender of fintech, uh, FinSec was, was out there, the government really um, decided this is a topic they want to threaten, this is where they want to have multinationals here, they want... Um, knowledge from the outside, the one investment into Israel, and so on. So I think that they're kind of selecting topics according to the next growth agent. We see it very clearly now with climate in Israel. We receive a lot of, a lot of focus, a lot of fund from the government. Also, not only really fund that is, uh, is eventually into the startup, but also into uh, knowledge sharing, uh, understanding the needs, doing a lot of research around it. So I think the government is really a big engine in Israel. Um, to push specific industry forward. Yeah, and we saw, we saw some of the details this morning in the presentation of, uh, of the Innovation Authority. Back to the nitty gritty of how you deal with uh, this one entity that represents government. And again, I think to, to some extent that's also unique by the size of a, probably also government in general. But you know, mm -hmm. compare with the Korea where we deal for quite a number of years, there are 350 innovation authorities. So uh, by definition, they don't work because they are not coordinated and are missing kind of a central point. It, when you deal with innovation authority, do you have a single person that represents your industry that is long-term kind of a internal internal champion, internal partners? If somebody is doing insurance here and wants to open you know, something similar around insure tech, just to give an example, would that, ha would, would that require to have a you know, the, the expert of that, that internal vertical that becomes your counterpart, or how does that work? I'll start, and if you have a different uh, knowledge, then uh, um, correct me. So, in specific topics, they do have um, someone who's leading it, and you can speak with, the, uh, with them. Um, but if you want a specific program, then I think you go to the professional staff, 
Um, they have uh, different divisions for early stage startups, for more mature startups, for working with multinationals. Um, so then you usually approach this, the professional, the professional person who's in charge of the division or in the program uh, depends. Um, so we do have a contact person uh, within the uh, the innovation authority. And, and I think, like in specific areas, you, you also have uh, experts, uh, domain experts, but uh, I think they, uh, they help shaping it, but they, they're less uh, the contact from, for multinationals. So I, I would advise uh, contacting the, 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 the internal champion. Great. I think there are guys that are consistent in, uh, with the answers. And uh, I mean, the, the picture that comes across is something very, very uh, professional and, and very worth uh, you know, the time uh, of, of a corporate to, to look into. Maybe, or right, we should talk about what you guys do because you have a, a wide range of activities. You've been doing this for a long time. So maybe give us a little bit of the history of uh, your presence here and uh, in the different areas that we mentioned before, which which area is that uh, the focus for you today? Sure. Um, so maybe I'll talk about just a bit about my personal journey, but by then I'll, I'll explain what we did here. So I started the role about six or seven years ago. It was actually an on-top assignment. So I'm, I'm actually an accountant, unfortunately. Nobody's um, perfect. Exactly. We all make mistakes. Uh, but about seven years ago, I basically asked to, um, I told my, my boss that I, I don't see my future as, as the future CFO, and I'd like to do something else. They said, all right, what would you like to do? And I said, open innovation. I would like basically to relaunch PNG's innovation activities in Israel, because about 15 years ago, we had some innovation activities here. But honestly, I mean, between us here, it was more about PR. Yeah. Was, uh, was what it was showing in the first slide that it was still the era of marketing. Exactly. Um, and you know, what, what I wanted to, to suggest is basically let's you know, put the PR aside and let's actually uh, create some, some meaningful results. And luckily, after two weeks, they came back and they said, hey, this is great. From now on, you're leading this activity, but it's an on-top assignment. So that's how it started. After a year, when the results started to show, it became 20% of my role. Another year, it became 50% of my role, and I got linked to the uh, global headquarters. And a year later, it became a full-time position. And a year later, it became a team. Um, so basically, um, that's you know, in, a, in a nutshell. Basically, what we are doing is we are working with all the different uh, global business units. We interview them on a quarterly basis. We understand where their challenges are. We actually sit also in the strategy meetings. So in order to really understand the, 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 the path of each business unit and not only what are their main challenges right now, but also where they see themselves in five and ten years from now. So do you have recurrent meetings that you know are dedicated to strategy where innovation is right. one of the key topics? Right. Um, and according to that, we go back uh, basically to... Um, to the, the local ecosystem, the VCs, the accelerators, etc., and we share the, the challenges. Actually, maybe just uh, a little, uh, a little uh, add. Before we actually get, engage externally, because usually right now we already have a reputation within PNG that the innovation arm is, is, is quite known within PNG. Um, so whenever a business unit approaches us with a, with a challenge, we first tell them, all right, we'd be happy to help, but only if you answer three prerequisites. First, we want that uh, requirement to come from your VP, because we want to make sure that they look at it as a must-have versus a must-have. Second is budget for the sake of the POC. Um, between us, again, I can, I can tell you that we have that budget, so I can support many POCs throughout the year, but I want them to have skin in the game. And third is human resource, because we realize that the most important thing for the entrepreneurs is their time. And we will not accept a situation where the entrepreneur needs to chase the corporate guy that you know would be uh, doing her a favor and will be answering her emails once every three weeks. Or well, just, just to, to stop you, because I think you say something that is super relevant. Because I yeah. and unfortunately, we see these open energy activities working with any corporate. We see when they work and when they do not work. 
And what you say, this is the three query requirements. And it is, is, a, is a statement you can make after, I believe, uh, some years of getting an internal reputation, right. creating an internal appetite, right. producing some results, and creating sort of internal healthy competition yeah. and culture where you, what you do is relevant. Because probably if we have some companies that are just starting the game, if they go there and say, oh, we have three careers, they sure. say, okay, sure, no. sure, sure. that's the door. <laughs> they <laughs> don't show up anymore because I don't even listen to you. They're yeah. telling me to do something that I, I don't have time, I right. don't believe is important. And now you also tell me to put in some conditions. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And I think when, when we started it, we focused on quick wins. So we took whatever we got. It wasn't huge projects that, you know. Give us an example of what was a quick win. A quick win was actually a, a company that uh, created automated subtitles for our commercials for every language. It wasn't substantial. It didn't create huge amounts of savings, but we were able to gain, that was my, my first project. We were able to, to provide value to the business unit quickly, and they started talking about us. That was, that was a quick win. We did it in, I think, one month or so. It was a collaboration. Yes. Yeah, it was a collaboration with, with so a startup. We call yeah. venture clients. So yeah, exactly. Venture client, quick win, something yeah. that doesn't involve 55 different people, right. millions or something. Right. You get uh, the ball rolling and then you yeah. get speed. Yes. Exactly. How do you formalize those wishful you know, uh, engagement levels? Because it's easier said than done, right? So do you formalize it just, you know, it just expected that the rules of engaging with you guys are the three that, uh, that you mentioned? Uh, we, we have a very structured process. So whenever we receive an approach, they automatically receive the, the prerequisites. These are actually five, but I, we always tell them it's only three, and we then add the, the additional two, because they would throw us. Yeah, the additional two just for the sake uh, of curiosity. So additional two, and we, we tell them just towards the end of the process, is one, define what success looks like, or in other words, KPIs. Um, because you know we don't want we, we had this was all you know written from from our bad experience right so we don't want to finish a POC and you know we are pleased the entrepreneur is happy even the business units are happy and then we're tell we're saying all right so now we can we continue to scale and then they will tell us oh we don't know maybe next year we need to think about it no 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 if you told the startup that they need to deliver two x and they deliver two x we continue to scale. No questions asked. Honestly, we don't care about POC. We only care about scaling. And the fifth one uh, is, is budget for the sake of scaling. Unlike the budget for the POC, which is, you know, I would ask for sort of a wire transfer of $50,000, this is intangible because uh, we don't know which startup will be chosen, so we have no idea to, uh, to estimate how much would it cost. But we assume it would be hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I want to hear the VP telling me, yes, or if you find the right startup, I have sufficient budget for you. Cool. No, that's, uh, I think it's a good lesson for everybody here. And every company has their own internal processes, but I, I think the way that you structure is very, uh, the expectations are clear from the beginning. Is there a document that you share physically with, uh, with the business unit there? Uh, or uh, Usually it's via email. We prefer to, okay. to keep but it simple. You but use, yes. a, use a form. Yeah. And use something formatted right. yes. that it doesn't require you know a legal person to to print on it, but right. but is uh, is including those elements. But just to underline the last one of the last sentences that you say, uh, I think it, we were talking about the different stages of becoming a popular start of stars, and then at the latest stage you are moving from counting the POCs. That again, for a company that started a few years ago, is the first KPI to get right. to even not looking at them, looking at the implementation. Right. And then looking at the potential impact of the BNR. Yeah. This is step number three. And, yeah, and that's, that's exactly, and that's how we, we're being measured. Yeah. When I started my role, my the CIO asked, oh, how should I measure you? Yeah. Yeah. Number of we'll, we'll, we'll talk about measurement in a second. Let's finish the, the round here. Back to Dikla, actually. Um, I, I, I smiled during, well, Or was talking, because five years ago, when I just started, I met Or. And back then, five years ago, the industry tried to crack the cyber insurance question. By the way, still today, it was not cracked. But I told them, or I'm going for the gold. I'm going to crack the, the cyber insurance for the entire industry. And he told me, listen, Dikla, 
start with the small, start with the, with the minor projects, small, small win, really the one that nobody noticed, and it was so right. And I was smiling when you say that because it's proved, it, it's proved that this is the right path. So, yeah. So, how are you today implementing Venture Model? So, are you talking about which model are we using or are we doing the scouting? In general, are you doing the scouting? What okay. are your internal processes? What have okay. you learned along the way? Okay, so we have, of course, two paths to go with the scouting. One is a push, meaning we find something interesting in the, in the market. Uh, it's not enough just to find something interesting. I have to develop by myself already the know-how. So I have to develop during the years the ability to look at technology, to understand the product, the value proposition, and how it talks to insurance. Why I need to do that? Because a lot of time the business unit doesn't have, they don't have time or really the vision to see that they really have to get the full story. They cannot just get a vision and run with it. If we want it to work in the end, they have to have the full product ready. So a lot of my work is really a product work eventually to define the value proposition, what, what the value for the insurance industry. And then we... Internal sales. You, you can say that. Clever one, but yes, but sales. And then we have to decide which of the business unit is of course the right fit from the professional perspective. But we have to, I have to say that after five years, I already know the people. So I know who will, uh, who will move faster. I know who has the budget. We already know the, the stakeholder that can lead those kind of projects. And when we have something like that, we, we try to push it, right? So we call it the push. Um, and we're working together with the business unit to see whether it's a, it's a real need. Well, if it's a real need, it will probably work. If it's not a real need, probably people will, won't have time for it and we will understand it's not a real, uh, it's not a real uh, project and it's not a, a real need. The other way is to receive a request uh, from the business unit. I have to say that for me being here and on right Munich Israel, Munich Israel, um, I always have to balance between two ecosystems. And this is a, a huge challenge because I have to be here the ecosystem needs to know me, the entrepreneurs, the VC, everybody needs to know me. On the other hand, I have to be there. So the business unit, and we're talking about 40,000 uh, uh, people in Munich Re, with a lot of unit, people need to know that I'm here and to be aware of my work. So I cannot only wait for them to send me my, their request, I have to do a lot of reach out. I have to do a lot of marketing of myself, right? And, and the services that we're doing for the organization so they will know about us. But if we get a request, usually, uh, the, the probability that it will um, turn into a real project is higher than we're doing the push. So the full model is better. Exactly, yes. So, walking the corridors, marketing, preparing the use case, the business case, you're selling internally. Mm -hmm. And we're also the product developer in the end. developer, and then you have to do all the scouting on top. Yeah. But what have you learned along the way uh, to be more effective, right? Because the the dancing with a business unit is a is an issue for everybody, right? And depending on the internal structure, it might be more more or less formal. But what have you learned in, in 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 the years of doing this to be more effective? What would you recommend other companies to look at? It's a difficult question, uh, but first, it's all about people. It's all about people in the business unit, and it's all about people here in the ecosystem, the the CEOs and and the CTOs of the startup. Uh, this is the first one. The second one that a lot of time we're the innovator, we really trying to bring solutions that are really pushing it, right? Really cutting edge, the next thing. As a lot of the, also because we're Israeli and we have some crazy idea, we come with really crazy idea. Usually the organization is not ready for this crazy idea. We need to really do um, our organization between what is a crazy yet where there is a real need. And where, only when there is a real need that is usually really connected into the core business, then the probability that it, it will be successful is, is much higher. Yeah. So you cannot go H3 when you're doing, obviously, a venture, venture uh, client model. Moving up the scale here, now it's time for an investment side. And I think that uh, the experience of Boeing is a very interesting one, because I think it's a, it's a story that we're seeing more and more, right? So first, you know, the big decision of uh, starting the CDC, we've seen data, most of the corporate startup stars do have a, an arm, an investment arm. But the second, the second one is also the ability to start, or the consideration to externalize the management of the CDC, or at least to open it with multiple LPs. So maybe you can share a little bit of, the, of that path that happened at Boeing and Horizon X. 
we're thinking of also uh, writing a book and selling a movie because a lot the of Netflix, people are, yeah, sure. uh, are interested in this uh, new hybrid model. Uh, but before I go into the hybrid model, we've been in this business since 2017. Uh, that's when we formed Horizon X, our, our CBC. Um, and I'll say, you know, you talk about uh, lessons learned and, and the maturity of these CBCs. I have a lot of scars on my back and a lot of pain and a lot of getting kicked out of conference rooms because we started with, you know, we were the CEO's baby. Boeing is blue. I don't know if everyone knows it, but our, our you know, we have a Boeing blue that's the only approved external comms and Horizon X was red. And that means nothing, but it's also like the biggest decision that was made because what do you mean? This business unit has the red color. Everyone has to be blue. You're red. So that was like the first day we realized there wasn't really a red flag right there. <laughs> yeah. and it wasn't so difficult to so, catch. Something different with this group. And then we had the very opaque mission of disrupting Boeing from the outside. So doing what the business units would not or could not do on their own. You're a business unit. You have to crank out 737 airplanes and you have to do it faster, more efficiently. You don't have time to look at a startup from Israel or a startup from Germany or wherever we're coming from. Get out of my way. I, I have a mission and I need to you know, deliver my mission. And it's very hard to stop this you know, slow but steady moving uh, ship and then get it to seek those innovations, especially in these cycles of five, 10, 15 years where startups can die in these uh, uh, time slots. So that's how we started. We made a bunch of investments that we thought were going to disrupt us. So there was an evergreen fund, evergreen. Uh, you know, with a with a sign sign off of the CFO and the CEO itself. Yeah. Red code red, number of internal partners. And here or, I come to the business unit and say, look, I have a great startup that you should look at, and it's going to help you. And you're like, Oop, I didn't ask for this. Why do I need this? What? Well, I'll pay for the POC. I'll pay for whatever. I didn't, then I didn't even keep on paying to keep it alive, and it wasn't a very sustainable model. Because the expectation was it was mostly strategic, even more than we we had some wins it. there. You know, because, but there's a limit to how much you know the daddy said, mommy said model can work. You can't abuse the top down. It has to have some buy-in at the bottom. The subject matter experts that need to work with this, and and we're going up against the biggest not invented here community you can think of. We have people with double and triple professor titles and you know they are not interested in what some guy in Rothschild uh, here has to say about quantum or about uh, cyber. So that was the beginning. Okay, that's uh, still at the beginning. I was wondering the next question, when do you think that you hit the wall? Uh, well, we hit the wall, COVID came, 77 Max issues came, CEO went away. Now, I, I was expecting that. CEO's baby. Red, you know, people know what we are the, <laughs> the fat in the shawarma in these days now when, when budgets are being cut. Um, and we had to find a model for survival because our new CEO said, you know, he came in to meet with us, he came in and met with a lot of us. He said, When you say ASA was already a group of people there working with Yeah, we, we at the time were a team of uh, 40, 45. Oh my God. Uh, it wasn't just ventures, it was innovation, strategy, and a, a, a bunch of other uh, party management functions. Uh, and he said, I love what you're doing, but you don't have any more money. Go find money or stop what you're doing. So we got approval to raise. How many company portfolio? At that time, we had uh, just over 20, 22 companies. Uh, and the fund, fund one was you know, alive and still going, but no new investments. So we were kind of like, okay, you know, this is going to be. And even follow up. In, uh, Very difficult to follow on. We have to either dilute ourselves or only follow on on the big really movers for the fund that were truly making their way into the market. So you're moving from Evergreen to sometimes. <laughs> Correct. Uh, got approval to go and raise capital from outside. Uh, this was very difficult uh, going you know, with the customers that they have, the DOD and, and US uh, military services. You, you cannot accept money from different nations and different flags, so really limited who we could yeah. get money from. Um, but you still had a that branding, Horizon X, clearly, you know, branded by Boeing. Correct. Everything else was Boeing. And we basically went from being the GP to being an LP in the in the fund in fund two. Uh, and a few positive side effects. So one, it was very sad. We broke up the band. You know, the investment team lifted and shifted, exited Boeing, and now part of a different private equity shop uh, called Air Equity industrial partners, they make investments in aerospace. 
Um, and I, I was left in Boeing leading the, the team that stayed. Um, but then it really strengthened us. We moved up in the org chart to reporting to CTO and chief strategy office, the two, two uh, um, EXCO members, um, and then have access to more capital than we had internally in our evergreen fund that was kind of limiting the speed in which we could move. Now there is private equity at our dispense, uh, and if there's something that meets their investment criteria, meets our strategic needs, it, it's, uh, it moves faster. Um, and I hate to you know, use this word, but uh, we were institutionalized a little bit. So going on these kind of crazy cowboy, disrupt Boeing and find someone that will believe that they should invest in this disruption as well to what do you want to need? And where are you going in five to 10 years from now? Uh, we, we really started doing a little bit more of the internal surveying and I've got a little black notebook that has all the dirty secrets of the Boeing company. And not just, we like batteries, we're gonna to need to invest in uh, quantum or whatever your buzzword IoT. It's this type of battery with this threshold that needs to meet these, you know, humidity, temperature, and G-shock. And then if it doesn't meet, you know, this very, very clear line, I'm not gonna waste your time, your time, her time, and bring forward. So we, we do a lot of filtering at the edge. We're a very smart and sharp scouter. Um, and when we bring something back, it's a hit because we knew exactly what you wanted and we may have surpassed what you when wanted. When you say bring something back is an investment or something it's, where a, a, can, a candidate also. in the pipeline that we perform due diligence on and then we determine if it's gonna be, you know, if it defies the law of physics or if it's gonna really uh, meet uh, what so, we need. So basically the, the split of the, the, the X, Horizon X, as a, you know, the investment team that does investment through a different set of LPs and you, you represent the seniority within Boeing to have the, the buy-in from the strategic point. Correct. And, and you know, this is uh, the voice of Boeing into uh, the fund. Uh, we don't have any frenemies in the fund. We have other private, and we're, we're looking to see who else will be invited to invest with us in fund two. If you are an investor, let's talk afterwards. Um, but uh, the, the Boeing is the anchor investor, and we are setting the tone for um, the strategic needs, you can, or the fund can, invest in something that we don't want or need, but then you're not going to get Boeing support. And as long as it meets our list of criteria and our focus areas, we will throw the weight and power of the Boeing company behind us. We will invite you into our wind tunnel. We will invite you into our lightning strike conductor. We will invite you into wherever. We'll take you into space, literally, on a, on a rocket ship. Um, but if you are a uh, fintech or uh, whatever company that we don't have or need for, but it's a great exit for you or a great investment, um, so don't just, expect us to just, just two follow-up questions. We, we need. Two quick follow-up questions. Number one is, uh, again, you are you are represent Boeing for the portfolio companies and you do part contribute to the due diligence. So essentially you may give them potentially an open door to Boeing for the portfolio company as an investor from a full party funds that is quite easy because you are, you are the LP. And the other way also you are providing due diligence. So the question is uh, all this stuff is, is subject to the fact that they have been invested or you are also scouting for solution that might just enter a partnership with Boeing without any investment needs. So uh, just to your first part point, uh, we like to say that we offer unfair access but not unfair results. I'll get you the meeting with the CTO, I'll get you the meeting with the Vice President of Defense, commercial, whoever it is that's relevant for your business, but it's on you to, to follow up and deliver. You them. open the door, but the door remain open, you can also get out. Right? Yeah, and if, and if you promise something and then in half a year or three months from now, you're not living up to what you promise, I'm not gonna be able to defend you. So unfair access, but not unfair results. Um, and then we've had now in this new model, Situations where it's a strategic need for the Boeing company, we need this widget, we need this whatever technology is. The business model isn't wonderful, the returns are so-and-so, very CapEx heavy. Our investors are saying, uh, I like this SaaS company, you want this you know, million dollar hardware company. Um, and then we've had some hard discussions where we decided, okay, uh, either we have a direct investment from the Boeing company, we go to the M&A and all that uh, good, other alternative processes, or we uh, are 
enabling a future supplier to Boeing. So there's an off-ramp for we're not going to be an equity uh, stakeholder, but we are going to help champion your onboarding into Boeing because Boeing doesn't know how to work very well with small, medium businesses. So because of our functionality, we know how to contract with you, we know how to offer some of the work and, and purchase order, and we will project manage this until the yeah, business yeah, venture yeah. clients in the but, but do you technically have a veto rights over the investments of the Horizon X now, or, or just that? As now, a... now we do not. Uh, now it's, uh, we are a strong voice in there. Uh, but, but there's a risk if they, if they, Horizon X, make investments that we don't want, we will not be a future investor in Fund 3. So there's a... Fewer LP, we do. Yeah. Um, and I'll say one, one, going back to your question, is that, um, we're, we're also in the... You know, in the make, buy, invest decision making right now under a CTO. So if you have an R and D project and you want to, I, I stuck, I'm stuck on batteries, but build a battery uh, inside the Boeing company, and you come to the CTO and say, I need fifteen million dollars for this project, they will say, Have you checked with AL and Applied Innovation, and what have you benchmarked against externally, and what's readily available in the supply chain, or as a future investment that can be made in the startup? So we've matured to that process where. We are a check mark on the list of you don't just get R and D money unless it's been vetted externally. So your due diligence equals to the R and D. Correct, and that's that's, and that's the smart. that's the place of kind of maturity that we really got to from being a, a nuisance and a, and a mosquito that's coming to upset everyone to okay like they're in the big boys club now and uh, that's uh, something that we got formally recognized as. No, I think that's. Uh... I think uh, a, a great learning learning lesson, so I think, for the community overall, because it, uh, I think that's definitely something to consider to replicate. Uh, the fact that going back into the CTO is actually particularly interesting, because we're trying to, to some extent, we're kind of a isolate the whole innovation unit outside of the core business. Instead, you, are, you have a feedback loop that comes from the top. I'll put the... the... Uh, entrepreneur hat on for a second, and I was a startup CEO before this, so I, I always wear the entrepreneur hat also. But you know, our fund one CEOs were very uh, had difficult times when they were going to their next rounds because now they are painted as a Boeing company, and painted they're red. Yeah. <laughs> and there are only so many aerospace companies out there that want and need uh, your product, and if you are already working with one, then you know, I'm not going to let you into my. So that was a challenge that you know we had to put in the uh, firewalls in the boardroom and what access do we, the Boeing team, have and don't have and competitive information. Now uh, we are healthy, and the board seat is held by our investment uh, partners, Horizon X. So there's a bit of a filter there between us, and also is more palatable for our competition and our frenemies that they look at the startup in the next round and say, okay, Boeing is on the cap table, but not in the boardroom, right. in these uh, decisions. Yeah. Which is a process actually many companies have, have been through at, at that stage. Uh, how many LPs are there in the fund? Just two now, right? Is there oh, um, more than one? There are more. more than two? Uh, we're not naming it quite yet, uh, but some big names and uh, some private money, private equity money. Um, but uh, we're targeting a $250 million fund. Um, and uh, Boeing has uh, committed uh, about a quarter of that right now. So let's okay. do the math. Uh, but is, we'll see how it flows and then shapes up, and Boeing may lean in a little bit more, a little bit less, depending on who and how and come in. And the private equity entity that you were mentioning, the Aero equity industrial partner, industrial partner, are they also the manage the manager of the fund? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's an interesting model. There's incentives for all parties, obviously for them being the managing partners of the fund and the and the management fees that they will collect. Um, but uh, we have KPIs in place, so I, I, I don't know if I said this in my opening, but I get measured on technology transitions, mm -hmm. not on the exits and the financial uh, ROI. And it's a, it's a really clash because you know, my, my colleague, uh, Brian Shetler, who's on the, who leads the investment uh, vehicle, is, is always looking for that you know, uh, larger valuation in the next round and the, and the exits, and, and I'm looking for when are you going to get to TRL 9 and how can I already take this and put this on an F-15 or, or in an airplane? Um, and you know, my, my CTO will, will say this until he's blue in the face, technology, 
you know, uh, and innovation isn't uh, realized until it's transitioned. You can say you're innovative, you have a great idea, a great startup, whatever, but unless it actually makes it into our product and is now showing real world value, then that innovation is, is useless. So that's those moments is, is what we get uh, measured on. And that goes back to, I think, what Or was saying about really focusing on the big uh, bets and the big projects. Um, and this, I'll shut up after this, I promise. The, the strategy, uh, the chief strategy looks at us and says, you have way too many projects. You cannot have you know, 40 in your, in your sales force. What's going on here? Show me what projects you're going to kill. And, and what decisions have you taken to deliberately stop a project? Because it's not yielding technology yield, financial yield. You may love it. You may have been doing it for three years now. But you have a new project up and coming here, which has a much higher return and a much higher promise to transition. And you need to decide what you're going to stop or and go on. And that's that's really hard, especially as you're working with a startup that is you know tied in an umbilical cord to you, and you've been with it for three years. And now the moods and the winds have changed, and, and this is no longer a priority for the Boeing company. And we have to work on repositioning them and finding them a landing place without uh, killing the company. And that's and there's also an issue when you have internal R&D oh, yeah. of, of being able to sell kind of so much of this IP that is sitting there and it has no, no real value. How do I clean it? So yeah. this, is, I think, is part of an extension of the same process. Excellent. Anybody else here in the companies have a, a CVC or an investment unit? So we don't have a CVC or investment unit, but we did make two investments here in Israel, with Israeli startups. Um, both of them were actually based on those strategy discussions that we had uh, about the you know, five, ten years vision. Um, so even without a CVC, we do uh, some you know, uh, off-balance sheet investments. <coughs> So as part of the model and the way that the Israel Innovation Authority works, actually they provide 85% um, of, um, they provide a grant of 85% of the, uh, actually the expenses, and we provide the additional 15%. So it's small investments, and sometimes uh, we can take companies, uh, we can actually take companies not necessarily with the IEA, we can work internally, we can work with the ecosystem, uh, with Israelis or non-Israel companies. Um, but if we want to work with the IA, then the Israel Innovation Authority, then we have these uh, uh, obligations or other obligations. So with very early stage startups, we sometimes also put these small investments, even if they don't go the uh, Israel Innovation Authority route. Um, in your case, it's also a complication. So the joint venture is capitalized by the two, the two yeah. Uh, entities and, yeah. and has a separate entity for to take equity or is using the capitalization of the joint venture? It's under the joint venture, actually. Um, well, um, yeah, eventually it's under the, the joint venture, yes. Um, and then MasterCard, I believe they do a balance sheet investments into startups, right? Separately, yeah. As far as I know. Without any of the legal yes. So uh, related to what Or just mentioned about futuristic topic, uh, and a lot of our clients, primary insurance around the primary insurance companies around the world are asking us about it because Unicre is considered to be quite advanced with the thinking of technology. A lot of time, when we don't want to be stay behind, right? We still want to follow some development, quantum computing. For us, it's crypto. If we will not understand what's happening right now with crypto, we will not be able to launch in three years from now crypto insurance. By the way, there is already a product on the market by Munich but it started because we did an investment in a company. We were not able to bring any value to them except for the money, but we followed them and we learned from them and we saw what they're doing. And now, after three, four, five years, we've been able to, to launch a product because we already understand the story. So a lot of time, of course, startup will not talk to us if we have no real value proposition for them. And the only way we can still be in the game and understand what they're doing is through investment. So it doesn't have to be like a portfolio of 10, 15. It could be only one or two with two topics. Just for example, as we took uh, Quantum, uh, we had a discussion earlier today with a primary insurance, very good one, uh, about what's going on with autonomous driving, electric vehicles, and so on. 
not to be outside of the picture at the minute a product need to be launched. We need to be with the knowledge already. So it's 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 important point. Yeah, again, is uh, sitting in the back seat. That is something that yeah. in order to enter the car, you need to put some money on the table. And I think is what I'm what we're referring that CVC for us the perfect way to be designed is to look at horizon two and horizon three. Is exactly that way because it's the only way you can. One big big talk. Asking because I prefer to get some questions from the audience, but I don't think we can discuss or over a drink after is how, if you are doing investments into startups, are able to measure the strategic contribution to your company. Because again, it's, it's obvious that you are contributing to the future strategy of the company through the Procter and Gamble 2035 and the of 2040, but it's very difficult to grasp or measure. We are working with some. Uh, Global company to try to find also some potential KPIs to measure the strategic contribution is still there. Because in the investment committee, this is what the VC is claiming that there is a connection. But it's a really good question. How do you, after the investment, measure it? Exactly, yes. This is a big topic again. We don't have an answer, but the topic is as big as on the table. And so if you want to contribute, we are, we are investigating. All right, before we open to the audience, just at a Twitter level, so a tweet from you, I think uh, Ayal already covered how you define success internally and the KPIs. So maybe you can go real quick, how do you define success at the end of the year for you? And maybe one success story that you think that this is my poster child that I think I can you know, use internally uh, for as a success story. Pressure. Um, so, I think I uh, implied to that earlier, we are being measured according to the financial value that we bring to the company, either uh, top line or, or uh, bottom line. Um, I think a success story, I'm, I'm trying to think of a success story that I can share, um, which is more challenging. Um, but one of the startups that we invested is called uh, Green, Get Green. It's a uh, teledentist. It's in the teledentistry space. Mm -hmm. It's actually an add-on device that you add to your phone and you can uh, take pictures of, of your mouth. It translates it into a 3D model, and it saves you the, the trouble of going to the orthodont. Basically. How does that uh, integrate to your some of your brands? So it integrates very well with Oral B and Crest, uh, some of the, the world largest uh, um, oral oral care uh, health brands. Um, we already have some very promising results right now and we have great plans for them in the future. So, so there you expect just future revenues as yeah. simple as that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think we covered a little bit, but if you want to add anything. Just a success story maybe. Um, so I mentioned we, our KPI is technology transition, uh, but a success story that we had recently was uh, with a company called uh, Red6 AR. They are an augmented reality company. Um, they have a visor that comes down on the uh, pilot's uh, helmet and offers in-air augmented reality. So you can imagine you are now in a fighter jet and need to practice going to a tanker and getting a refuel. And you, you want to do this quite a few times. Practice it before you go and bump into that boom that comes out. So you put the lens down, and now you see a tanker uh, in augmented reality. But the, the the uniqueness here is that you are in up in the air, not in a simulator on the ground. You are really in your aircraft, and you are now in a simulator environment in theater in the real aircraft. So why is this a success story? Um, our business unit came to us and said we have a customer requirement. They want to you know uh, next generation training systems. And we don't have anything, you know, apart from our, our moving full motion simulator. Um, and we had this company that we looked at and was so cool and we tried to bring it to you a year ago and you didn't want it. But here it is in our sales force, let's do, a, you know, do it again. The revenge time. And, uh, and, you know, it's an investment, a purchase order, a technology transition, all in one. scaling now. And, and scaling and going from one uh, aircraft to another. But, you know, the, the foundation was there. We knew it was in our repository. We've already reviewed them. We knew what the business unit wanted. It was kind of in the parking lot. We had a warm connection there. Uh, and then we brought it into uh, the business unit. Um, so for us, it is a tough question because um, 
just imagine the incentive was uh, having the boots on the ground in Israel and uh, getting exposed to innovation. So how do you measure that? Um, um, so it's a quantitative and qualitative uh, KPIs, and we're still working on them. Uh, having uh, so them maybe the amount of companies that uh, we share and that are relevant to our shareholders, um, and then if they become successful. So now we're talking with very early stage companies, so and we're operating for a couple of years. Um, we had one exit and uh, three advanced rounds for two of our companies, and we really hope uh, that they will be successful because then uh, they will uh, scale MasterCard's uh, revenues in the long run. Why is the exit um, a success story for you guys? Um, well, it, it, it's a very good question, but actually, um, for us it means that we chose well. Um, on the other hand, um, it doesn't necessarily have, have, have to be a success story because you want to work with a company, uh, you invest money early, you want to work with them like, I know, three years, two years uh, later. Um, so I think it mainly, it's, it's a success story mainly because um, in the ecosystem, it is considered a very good thing and it means that uh, we chose well. Um, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because again, it's a challenge for us. If a company exits, we, we really have some problems. Uh, yeah. We need to secure our technology uh, uh, agreements before that happens. Yeah. Exit is not always yeah. a success story. Dikla. I will give you a tweet, just to refresh. Um, I think that we're you very... A tweet by Elon Musk at all. Oh, by Elon Musk, it will jump first in the Twitter, now with the new algorithm. I mean, uh, it's increasing to one million characters. <laughs> I think that in Israel, it, you heard about Israel, of course, and how Israel is embracing failure, and there is a failure tolerance approach. And I think organization and corporate has to have the failure tolerance approach and the ability to understand when to kill project, and I all mentioned it, and also or, and and to know that the organization needs some gap for this failure. Not every project can succeed, but. If we're not trying, it's the worst. So even with the project, the insurance, the big, big use cases, we still need to try, we still need to work it. We're really supporting, of course, working with external partner because we think that we cannot develop everything inside. But the failure of terms, it's not so uh, obvious when you're talking to a German corporate or to a London-based corporate. So I think this is the first thing that has to come as a cultural thing. Uh, and it really changes the face of innovation. And also people less afraid to do mistakes, they take more risk. So you see that as one of your KPIs, being able to somewhat change that uh, mentality of... Uh... So I wouldn't say it's a KPI, but I would say this is something that we from Israel try to push as a cultural thing. It will not be measured as a KPI. I think the question of KPIs is something that we're all dealing with. What is a success? Can you measure a success as an execute as success, as a POC as success? But in the end, even if we will not have, a, I know corporate that didn't have POCs, they didn't have any success story that is measurable, but still without innovation, they will die. So I think for us, KPIs always have to be really um, holistic. They cannot really be by number. Five years of inve five investment, and they can be the worst investment. So it has to be more integrated with the, the, world. the, uh, the strategy world. of the company. All right, I think it's time to open to the audience if you're still awake. You guys still awake? Uh, drinks and stuff are outside. So um, any questions that we have here? Please, if you have a question, just introduce yourself real quick. I'm curious to hear who's in the audience. I hope this was relevant for you guys, but uh, otherwise we'll just go to drinks right now. <laughs> Please introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. My name is Lorenzo. Uh, I'm part of Peliconi, which is the, the top uh, market leader for crown caps and crown corks. So every cap you find uh, in every kind of glass bottles, whether it be Coca-Cola, Nestle, or ABI. Um, and thank you for sharing your experiences. 
And since we came now talking about failures, is any of you willing to share also a story of failure? And perhaps, you know, also sharing the main learnings that you also were able to gather from this happy or unhappy experience. Thank you. We're very sharing in Israel. So I think that when I started five years ago, and I, I came to the, this, this role with a lot of connection, and one of the connection was to security agencies in here in Israel. And I saw a great vision in bringing those technology, that is, it's an army technology, into the commercial world. Um, and, and there's, of course, a lot of innovative and, and out of, really, imaginary, visionary things in those technology. But at the minute we really came to the table to build the product, the question of regulatory, privacy, GDPR, was really, really important, right? And, and, and although the vision was amazing, and the technology was amazing, and if it would have worked, the impact for the industry would have been the, the boring stuff of regulation, of privacy. I call it boring because sometimes for innovation it's a, it's, a, it's a barrier. But I think that right now we understand that this is a good filter. Um, so definitely this is one of, of I will say, a failure. Uh, we didn't invest uh, time and uh, a lot of time in energy, but in, in the concept-wise, it's, it's more challenging to execute upon um, than really think about, okay, this technology is amazing and keep it applicable. When you really come to build a product eventually, um, the regulation is, and compliance is really, really big, big use case, big problem. I mentioned our hubris in the beginning of just uh, investing in what we thought we was we were finding as disruptive technology, but not getting the buy, and that's obviously one of our, our biggest failures. But uh, I'll be honest with you, um, and this may be really an Israeli uh, culture thing. Uh, I encourage my team to to have failures, like every, everyone, and when, when we onboard someone new, we have a try before you buy period. And everyone likes to, you know, do well and have an accomplishment and, you know, present it and be very proud of it. And one of my onboarding criteria is to watch someone in an accomplishment phase, but also in a failure phase. How did they act in that uh, moment of failure? How did they recover? Um, and you'll you'll find, you know, some some real character uh, in people when when they fail and come back. It's very hard to fail in our environment. There is regulatory, there are so many, you know, you, you want to get to your destination, you don't want to crash, obviously. Um, and, and yet, in the innovation world, it's encouraged and you need to, and that's kind of the safe space to fail. Um, and that's where we have kind of the leeway. But when we bring our technology partners, the subject matter experts and the professors and the doctors and all these people <laughs> that aren't willing to fail, and we're taking them on a POC where they don't know what the results are going to be, we're also changing their behavior to, this is an area where if it fails, it won't tarnish your name, it's not going to be stuck on you forever, we're not going to publicize this all over on papers on, on your uh, CV, and, and that's just like lowering the threshold of what can and cannot be done in the sandbox of our innovation versus the real world and customer and regulatory bodies that they work in day in and day out. Well said. Yes, right here. You can probably hear you. I'm just uh, I don't know if I'm recording it. Hi, my name is Sagib Lustig, and I'm doing the open innovation for uh, L'Oreal in Israel. Now, we, all the multinationals started up until a few years ago with a model of basically just internal uh, R&D, internal innovation. And we are all developing all those models of uh, external innovation to coincide with the internal innovation, which is still the big part of uh, our R&D. At the beginning, we had the challenge of the NIH, the not invented here, which is today, I think, less relevant. But what is the main challenge you still face in trying to introduce external innovation versus all the internal R&D organization that is still acting in the same domains as the innovation that uh, you are uh, introducing. I got the mic, I'll go first. Uh, after you go 
past the non invented here that you so casually kind of swam through, and it's still a very big problem for me in my role. Uh, it, it's a uh, budget is a big issue for me. Our business units have their long range business plans, and they look at two, three, five years out. And now you want me to fund a $500,000 POC or buy some licenses or buy hardware. And, you know, where is this money going to come from and why should I divert it from what's going well with my supplier that I like and trust to this unknown startup from country X or country Y? Uh, so budget is, is, a, is still a big problem for, for us. Um, we're trying to help. We have some leeway. Uh, the chief strategy and, and CFO will say, if it's the right thing for the Boeing company, let's discuss it. Like, we shouldn't be holding accountable a business unit PL that's trying to do the right thing and break their budget, but let's offer some top down. And that's something that, that we help with by just sharing the message. Um, and then apart from that, it's uh, it's just really the willingness to take, to take risk. Uh, and you know, if you've been following the Boeing company these days, where you know our reputation is really what what is most important to to the Boeing company uh, and di differentiating us from from customers from our uh, competitors. And in order to take a leap of faith into uh, the startup world, you really have to have um, great confidence and put them through a lot of due diligence that uh, will limit the risk or reduce it to a point of, of uh, a threshold that we are, are, are willing to accept. So budget and risk, I think, are my big two ones after non dimension here. PNG, you, you develop a lot of... Uh... Products, so there's a lot of that syndrome, I'm sure, is embedded. Yeah, the NIH is, is very much uh, What's going on in uh, alive. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I would say that on top maybe of the NIH, there is a lot of, um, uh, I would say, suspicion uh, or suspicion towards, uh, towards startups, um, especially from our R&D folks, right? I mean, because for us, it's, it's natural to share knowledge and share data and work together and build together. But, but these, you know, they're, they're very respectful uh, R&D folks, you know, with very experience. They're not used to working uh, with, with external parties and to share data. And so whenever there comes a, a, a request from a startup, which is a legitimate request, we know that because we work with that startup, we need to bridge that gap. So even after there's... We put the NIH syndrome aside. It's just making that uh, collaboration really work is is a challenge, and it's a, it's an educational process, really. We, we work very hard at the beginning with the legal team to make sure everyone is comfortable. You know what you can say, what you cannot say, what you can share, what you can't share, uh, and that kind of just once there's a legal person that said to the professor, "You can talk about this. It's okay." Then they start uh, spilling the beans, and until they have that uh, mouthpiece removed, it's a one-way discussion, it's a one-way conversation, and you really want to start to start getting some mentorship back, and not just one way. But it's uh, it's still the legal scare of what can I share, what can I share, proprietary, non-proprietary. Uh, that's a big challenge for us also. Maybe stating the obvious, but of course people. Uh, so some people. Around the world, are very enthusiastic about innovation and startups and entrepreneurship, and we just need to find these people because these people will do almost anything to be there for a startup, learn more, um, advise, um, whatever. So, and when we find these people, it's very uh, easy to motivate. Um, sometimes uh, an entire business unit. This is on the one hand, and uh, when you find the uh, senior people who also uh, really care about it, you shared a lot about it, uh, and someone really uh, uh, is an advocate and uh, can um, make things happen or uh, avoid them from uh, uh, being shut down. All right, I think we have time for one more question right there. Got the pleasure of asking the last question. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Lena Feinstein. I'm uh, from a company called Noga Plus, and we are the strategic partner of Grupo Bimbo. Uh, Grupo Bimbo is the biggest bakery in the world. Uh, it's on the food tech arena. Happy to see some demos. If you 
So we can, well, I'm happy to see some demos right outside. Ah, yes. We don't have any business here in Israel, only innovation. <laughs> um, my question, I think something you didn't touch, and maybe it's obvious, is uh, do you invest in uh, research uh, with the academia, in applied research? I know it's very far away from, from product, but this is something that we are thinking and looking after, and we are in touch with a lot of uh, scholars from the academia, and I would like to hear your opinion here. Yeah, good point. So we touch more on the on the market side, less on, on the pure research. Probably you're the closest, right? With, with a, with a... Yeah, we actually do. Uh, uh, we do uh, invest in research uh, with the academia, both for our uh, uh, own um, and know-how, but also we want to contribute back to Israel. Uh, so we do invest in it uh, and really uh, look high at uh, academic research. How do you uh, we sponsor uh, research. Uh, we yeah, we sponsor res research. We participate in the advisory uh, committee. Uh, yeah, and uh, we also um, add to it our partners, our stakeholders, uh, to contribute to it as well. So, yes. uh, when we cannot find something that we are looking for, we go all the way left to the academia. And then we will either offer grants for research on a research topic that we will put forward or find someone who's close, but we just need to ask for some focus on something that we want and need. Um, and then we try and marry this with government and not just academia. One of the examples we're doing in Israel, or will be doing in Israel in the future, is around uh, biofuels and uh, SAF, uh, sustainable aviation fuels. Um, this is a, a, you know, green uh, territories for, for both academia in Israel, for the industry in Israel, and you know they won't go there unless there is a partner or an OEM at the end of this journey that will actually buy something, sponsor, have a product fit in the market. So we can't expect the academia or the startups to start bringing biofuel startups. We need to tell them, this is the market, this is what it would look like, this is what we're willing to pay. Um, so we're, we're actually starting that in Israel right now with uh, uh, the Weizmann Institute um, and uh, trying to help kickstart a new industry in the country. Well, I think that would be it. Let me thank the speakers here. Thanks for coming late and sharing your information. If you guys and everybody, if you are interested in this kind of conversation, we run a group on LinkedIn that's called Corporate Startup Stars, and that's essentially the same kind of conversation we've had uh, here. And the idea is really to maintain it as an open community of people that have uh, passion and, and similar issues. So thanks again, and uh, join me.